on Rogers TV. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to everyone who's here. We are united in action to make it livable. My name is Mally Ben Bear, and I am the chair for the board of directors at United Way Elgin Middlesex, and also the manager at the research at the Center for Research for Violence Against Women and Children at Western University. We start off the evening with our settlers' land acknowledgement today. United Way Elgin Middlesex is committed to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and to supporting the recommendations of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commi Commission. We view reconciliation as an opportunity to honour and elevate our commitment to Indigenous people living in our region. We acknowledge that our community is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Lenapewek, and the Attawandaran people. Today, this land is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. I would like to recognize the three First Nations community in this area. Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. I would like to also recognize the growing urban Indigenous population who call Elgin Middlesex home. I recognize that this land was taken from the Indigenous people who originally lived here and who were stewards of this land for centuries. I recognize the inequities connected to colonization, including suppression of language and culture. I recognize the land as community. As activists and community mobilizers, I understand the need to recognize the historical and present truths of the place we practice this community action on. Personally and as an organization, we commit to a continued journey of listening, learning, and working to redress the harms inflicted on Indigenous peoples. Miigwech. We're so glad to have you here, and we look forward to the insights of our incredible group of speakers this evening. Addressing complex social challenges requires complex strategies. Public policy work, including advocacy, government relations, is part of what United Way does every day. As a strong nonpartisan advocate, United Way works to keep important poverty and equity related issues front and center with leaders at all three levels of government. For decades, social assistance rates have fallen far short of meeting the basic needs of people who live in the margins. We are calling on the province to double social assistance rates. Now, I would like to hand over the mic to your host and moderator for the evening, Craig Needles. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have what I think is going to be a very uh, interesting panel and something that is going to be uh, very much worth your time. So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I first want to introduce our panel. Our first panelist is Dr. Cheryl Forchuk. Dr. Forchuk is the Interim Scientific Director for Parkwood Institute Research, a distinguished university professor at Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing at Western University, as well as a scientist, and an Assistant Director at Lawson Health Re uh, Research Institute. Dr. Forchuk's research uh, interests lie in the area of mental health, in particular, the development and testing of supportive models models of care. Dr. Forchuk's research explores therapeutic relationships and explores systems issues related to mental care, including implementation of the transitional discharge model, housing and homelessness issues, poverty, community integration, and the use of technology in mental health. So welcome, Dr. Forchuk. Our second panelist is Ashley Harp. Having personally experienced and conquered formidable challenges on social assistance supports herself, Ashley brings a unique and profound perspective to the work at Goodwill Industries. She has channeled her experiences into a source of strength and inspiration for others. Ashley is a dedicated circles coach with a transformative impact at Goodwill Industries since 2020. Leveraging a background in community development and empowerment, she specializes in guiding individuals towards sustainable success, committed to fostering collaborative environments that inspire personal personal and professional growth. Adept at building meaningful connections and creating positive change within communities, she is passionate about leveraging her skills to empower others on their journey to success and life stabilization. Welcome, Ashley. 
and our final panelist is uh, Jeff Preston, a uh, PhD, who's an associate professor of disability studies at King's University College at Western University. He teaches classes on disability, popular culture, and policy. He's a longtime advocate and motivational speaker. In 2008, Jeff drove his electric wheelchair 650 kilometers from London to Ottawa to raise awareness about the lack of accessible transit in the province. Previously, Jeff has served as a two-time chair of the Committee of Adjustment at City Hall, vice chair of Easter Seals, Ontario, chair of the Defeat Duchenne Canada, and vice chair of the leadership table for United Way's London for All working group aimed at complete uh, aiming to complete recommendations, rather, generated by City Hall's poverty panel. Now, I've said all that nice stuff about Jeff, but also damning criticism. He's also a good friend of mine. Welcome, Dr. Preston. <laughs> Later tonight, we're also going to have the opportunity to hear from President and CEO of United Way, Elga Middlesex, Kelly Zigner, who will be providing our closing remarks and letting you know how you can support this initiative. Uh, to begin tonight, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Elizabeth McIsaac, who's the president of the Maytree Foundation. It's a Canadian foundation that proposes evidence-based solutions to poverty. What a concept. Recently, uh, Maytree released their annual Welfare in Canada report, including analysis showing that social assistance rates are far behind being livable, driving our work to change systems and advocate for the equity of every person in Ontario. Elizabeth McIsaac is leading Maytree's work to advance economic and social rights in Canada. She's a dedicated builder and champion for the nonprofit sector with extensive experience in research, teaching, and direct service. Elizabeth has a deep history with Maytree. She previously served as director of policy and was the executive director of one of Maytree's signature ideas, the Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. Before returning to Maytree in 2014, Elizabeth established and led Moat NFP at the Moat Center at the University of Toronto, where she conducted and directed research on the challenges facing the nonprofit sector. Elizabeth currently serves as the chair of Making the Shift, a youth homelessness social innovation lab at York University, and as the chair of the City of Toronto's Housing Rights Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth McIsaac. Thank you for that um, too long introduction. I apologize. <laughs> I should have cut it off. Um, so thank you, and good evening to everyone. Uh, special thanks to United Way for the invitation to join this conversation this evening. It's such an important conversation to us, and I think it should be an important conversation to everyone in Canada. As mentioned, uh, Maytree is a, a foundation in Toronto. We consider ourselves a human rights organization. Um, we're a foundation, so that means that we do grant making. It also means that we use all the tools available to us. So we, we do our own policy work. We convene, um, and we do what we can to advance uh, the progressive realization of social and economic rights in Canada. We've been working on poverty for 40 years, and it's, it's really just since 2014 that we've taken on a human rights approach. And so for us, a human rights approach means that we focus on the systems that create poverty. And we focus on how the systems impact the dignity of each person. We believe that remedies lie in the systems, and so we're focused on changing the systems. Public policy is the scaffolding that supports our systems. And so we see public policy as a critical tool for change, a lever for change, and it's essential for advancing the right to an adequate standard of living. So that's what we do. But I was invited here tonight to talk about welfare in Canada. Uh, so let me start with the story. Where did that come from? Not sure if you've had an opportunity, if everyone knows what that is. It's available on our website. You can go to maytree.com, and there's uh, each year the reports are, are positioned there. It's worth looking through. It's highly accessible, and it gives very graphic details of where we're at on welfare. It's an annual report that we produce, and it looks at the incomes of people who receive social assistance. We look at four example households across Canada in each province and in each territory. We look at a single uh, unattached working age adult. We look at a single unattached working age adult with a disability. We look at a single parent with one child and a couple with two children. So those are the four households that we look at so you get a sense of what welfare and what social assistance looks like. 
The data is collected each year with the assistance of ministerial staff across the country. It's incredible the work that they do with us. They cooperate, it's collaborative, and we're incredibly grateful to those officials across the country. They come out to our webinars about it. And so I think it, it speaks to us of a spirit of cooperation with our, our government partners. It calculates the income based on the provincial social assistance rates, but also looks at what each of those household types will get in terms of federal benefits. So for families with children, that includes the child benefit. For, uh, for people with disabilities, it will include different benefits that may be available. It includes federal tax credits like the GST credit or what everyone probably received today, which is the climate action uh, whatever it's called. It showed up in your bank account with letters that you don't recognize. Um, the Project Welfare in Canada started in 1989, 35 years ago, by the National Council of Welfare. So I don't take credit for coming up with the importance and the, and the, the format for doing this project. The National Council of Welfare actually developed this model, model that many years back um, and began putting out these reports as a means of holding government to account for its ambitions and goals around poverty reduction. However, in 2012, the Harper government dissolved and defunded the National Council of Welfare, so we lost this data collection tool. What had been funded by the federal government to, to monitor po poverty in Canada was dissolved. And so in a very quick turn of events, and in a, it was a period of time, I'm not sure if everyone remembers, when people were grappling with the need for data, stats can, we were going through sort of convulsions around that being sort of pulled back, and we know how essential data is to making change happen. And so at that time, the Caledon Institute for Social Policy, led by Ken Battle, Sherry Torchman, and Michael Mendelson, and um, said, well, here we go, let's just take it on. And, and very, um, both admirably and pathetically, crowdfunded to continue the task of Canada monitoring our poverty rates. They did that for one year and then Maitri funded them to continue that work. When the Caledon Institute wound down in 2018, Maitri inherited the project and took it on because we know how essential it is for us to have annual reporting so that we watch what's happening. Essential to a human rights approach is that we continue progressively realizing various rights, social and economic rights. We need to keep getting better. We need to know if we're going backwards. And that's what this work does. It helps us know what, which direction we're heading in. Collecting and analyzing data is a critical part of accountability. It helps us understand whether social assistance is making progress on poverty. Is social assistance adequately supporting people? What are the questions around adequacy? Are people getting enough income to meet their basic needs? Can they afford on social assistance to pay rent, to have enough food? adequate clothing, and live a life with dignity. Data enables us to measure progress, and this is essential to our approach. Ideally, it should keep us on track with our stated goals, remembering that the federal government has made a commitment to reduce poverty by 50% by 2030. And so it's our duty, collectively as a country, to ensure and hold their feet to the fire. Are we going to achieve that? It's not looking promising. So what do the data tell us? So in this year's Welfare in Canada report, we did, we did a webinar in September. And again, if you are interested in this, if you're nerdy enough to want to get into the numbers and look at the charts in more detail, uh, the webinar po is posted on our website. And we had the two researchers, Jennifer Laidley and Mohi Tabara, take us through the actual research, look at the charts, look at how each of the provinces were, were, what was happening across the provinces and territories. And then we had a conversation with Tyler Meredith, who is a, a Maitri Fellow. He was also formerly a social policy advisor to the Prime Minister and most recently Chief of Staff or uh, Chief Policy Person for Christian Freeland. And so he walked us through what we should be thinking in terms of, yes, welfare rates are the domain and the prerogative of, of the provinces, but where can we also put pressure on the federal federal government, because poverty is every order of government's responsibility. So at a high level, the welfare rates in Canada left 98% of recipients in poverty. 98% of people receiving welfare are living in poverty. 73% are living in what we call 
deep poverty. So what does that mean? In Canada, the official poverty line or measure is called the market basket measure. Deep income poverty means having an income of less than 75% of that poverty line. So if we take one example household, the single unattached uh, working age adult, the market basket measure is $27,631 for Ontario. In London, it's a little bit less, it's 24,645. The deep income poverty level is $20,723. Welfare income for a single working age adult in Ontario is $10,253. Deep poverty was 20,000, poverty was 24, and the welfare income is 10,253. And to be clear, that's not just OW, that includes the federal tax benefits, as, tax credits as well. So not adequate. If we look at OW alone, Ontario Works, which is the, the Ontario program, the monthly amount is $733 per month, which breaks into two categories. And I'm gonna talk about this. I know that the call for action is about doubling the rents generally, but I have a story to tell in breaking this down because there is the question of adequacy. There is the question of, is it enough? And let's just make it enough but there are also insidious things in how we deliver the program that we need to be mindful of and think about. So if we look at the monthly welfare allowance, basic needs is $343 and the shelter allowance is 390. That's how they break it out. There's basic needs. Shelter is $390 a month. In London, the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment is $1,872. Obviously, there are more deeply affordable options out there, but the monthly shelter allowance is $390. The municipality of Chatham-Kent is calling on the province to increase shelter portion to match average rental rates, and the city of Belleville is also supporting it. However, we are at 390. But this shelter component is not a given, and this is where I want to just go off a little bit for a second. Shelter component is not a given. It's only provided if you have a shelter cost that the recipient pays. Recently in Halifax, we learned about a young man named Bradley Lowe, a 30-year-old man who lived in an encampment. He is a claimant in a legal challenge to claim the shelter allowance component of his social assistance, maintaining that his tent was his home. Because the system does not recognize that his tent is a legitimate shelter, he was denied the shelter component of his disability benefit and only received the basic needs allowance. You actually receive less money if you are homeless, and this is the same in Ontario. If social assistance is intended to alleviate poverty, it does not make sense to receive less support as your circumstances become more dire. There is a bureaucratic reason for this, and it's related to coordinating social assistance with rent geared to income, but it is not designed to support the person for whom the program is intended. It is designed to align with the administration of benefits. It serves the system. It does not serve the person. The net result, people without a home are put into a position that makes it harder and harder for them to get on their feet. You would be forgiven for wondering if, in fact, social assistance was designed to punish people who are poor. But because Bradley Lowe was living in an encampment and not paying rent, he was receiving $380 a month. He was fighting to get the full $950, the standard rate in Nova Scotia for people with disabilities. He and his lawyer were arguing that his tent was his home, and it was. Tragically, Bradley Lowe died this past December. His appeal to Nova Scotia's Assistance Appeal Board had not yet been decided. His lawyer, Vince Calderhead, is moving forward with the appeal because this is an issue that is affecting others who don't get their shelter allowance. So the very short answer to the question, are welfare rates adequate, is no. And over time, we have not made progress. In fact, we have gone backward. In Ontario, there has been no increase and no indexation. 
John Stapleton recently wrote an article in the Toronto Star and noted that because rates have not been raised nor indexed to inflation, they are effectively $200 less than they were under Premier Mike Harris. That's how many years later? We are clearly moving in the wrong direction. In the world of human rights, it's called retrogression, and it is a violation of human rights. Social assistance is a program of last resort. It is intended to be the last step before falling into poverty, to prevent poverty. But it is not preventing poverty, it is perpetuating poverty. 60% of people in Canada who live below the poverty line receive social assistance. As I mentioned earlier, 98% of people receiving social assistance are in poverty, 73% are in deep poverty. What are we doing? Part of it is how we see social assistance. I believe that governments see it as a problem. I believe that social assistance is an opportunity. I think it is an opportunity to invest in individuals, in families, and in communities. At its heart, adequacy is about people having enough income to live their life with dignity. So how do we make sure that they can live with dignity? In addition to social assistance and welfare rates, we need to consider that social assistance and our incomes generally, regardless of where they come from, interact in many ways at many different points in our lives with an array of other social protections and benefits and systems. The housing system, the health care system, employment standards, child care, education, and so forth. We have opportunities through all of these systems and their interplay to invest in people and their ability to realize their right to dignity and an adequate standard of living. And we need to act on these opportunities. What we know about social assistance and about the experiences of people who experience these systems compels us to act and to hold our governments to account. In closing, it's clear that we can and we must do better. That's why everyone is here tonight. It's very cold and yet people are coming out because we know it is that important. Total welfare incomes are deeply inadequate. It's past time to increase both the Ontario Works Benefit rates, the ODSP rates and tax credits and index these to inflation. We also must do better at coordinating other government sources of income and maximizing their potential. In addition to the call for OW rates and ODSP rates to be doubled and to index, we also need to continue to watch and, and to monitor things like the, child, the Canada Child Benefit. Is it enough? Is it adequate? The Canada Worker Benefit. Is it enough? Is it adequate? GIS and OAS, these are benefits that get paid to seniors. Early in the 2000s, Canada proudly tapped itself on the shoulder because we were doing well in terms of seniors' poverty. Not so much the case anymore. We're beginning to dig into those numbers as well. The Canada Disability Benefit. It was passed in this past, it, past year, uh, C-22. Um, we are at the point of regulations being drawn up and amounts being decided. It must be adequate. I fear that it won't be but it is up to us as, as members of our community to call to account our governments to make it enough. And for single working age adults who as a group are left behind in terms of federal government support, less than 5% of the money they get in terms of their welfare incomes comes from the federal government, which means they get very little and they need more help. The federal government hasn't done anything and they are experiencing the deepest and widest experiences of poverty. We need to consider how new tools can be created. Maitri has been working on a proposal called the Canadian Working Age Supplement, which would replace the Canada Workers Benefit because the Canada's Workers Benefit excludes people who are on OW. But we also have to look at how social assistance interacts with other social systems and supports, some of those which I already mentioned. Most importantly, we can re-envision social assistance as a program that puts the person first, not the system, not the balance sheet, but the person. We have an obligation and a duty. 
We need to ensure that it is designed intentionally and explicitly to prioritize people's human dignity and to support and invest in people so that they can live their lives and be contributors. When we talk about human rights and the human right to an adequate standard of living, we focus on the government's duty to respect, protect and fulfill our human rights. We need to remember that governments are us. We elect them. We empower governments to act on our behalf and we must hold them to account when they fail in their duty to protect the rights of our, of our neighbours and our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Elizabeth. That was uh, fascinating to hear the, the numbers laid out like that. And, and, and I'm sure a lot of us have heard that before. And I've been talking about issues like this on the radio for however many years. And I find that people, when they hear the numbers, when they hear it sort of laid out that way, it's pretty convincing that what we're doing right now is not... Uh, not even close to being acceptable. And it's also expensive when you talk about the impacts on the healthcare system, justice system. Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll get to a lot of that tonight. I, I, I want to turn to our, our panel to begin a discussion this evening. And uh, uh, Ashley, Cheryl, and Jeff, uh, thank you all so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, first, I just want to ask each of you individually why it was so important for you to want to be part of this conversation tonight. And, and whoever wants first crack at that, uh, feel free to go ahead. Okay, I'll start. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> While everybody took a step backwards. <laughs> um, I, I, I like the idea of human rights. I think the work of United Way is very much influenced by poverty, uh, filling in the gaps uh, from the lack of public policy that, that, that should be supporting people better. Uh, and as as a nurse, member of Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, last year we similarly came up with a very similar number, lobbying for simply doubling uh, doubling those those rates. Uh, so I'm here because I totally support what they're doing. I see on uh, on a systems level, but and on a person level, how bad policies hurt people, hurt families. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's 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 tragic and obvious at the same time. Ashley, your thoughts? Did I turn it on? Yeah. <laughs> Here you <Okay>. go. <laughs> um, so I work with individuals day to day that are currently living in the systems, and as someone who has had to navigate the systems myself um, as a young mom um, to get to where I am now, like I understand how hard that can be and how isolating it can be. So to be here today to advocate for the people that I work with on a daily basis to allow them to have a voice. That's me being here for them. Um, so that way they can be at the table with everyone else that's having those important conversations. Because if you don't hear about it, you forget about it. It's out of sight, out of mind. And that's how I feel a lot of people in poverty feel. Mm -hmm. They don't feel seen. They don't feel a part of the community. So to be here, that's that's so important so that I can be that voice for them. And, and you know what I find is that people will see folks in poverty just from being in London. It's, 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 it's all over. You can't really escape it. But nobody really wants to think about how that person got there and what systemic choices governments made to get that person to where they are. Well, and to be honest, we're in such a crisis alone, just everybody feeling mm -hmm. it right now, that we're just one you know, crisis away from also needing those services, if you think about it. So we need to make sure that they're accessible and at a rate that we can still kind of live without being impacted and losing everything. What about you, Jeff? 2024 is the 10 year anniversary of when I left the Ontario Disability Support Program. It's 10 years ago that I left the program, which people applaud and, and think that that's a great thing. And, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't for me. Uh, it felt like an inevitability. When I first started on ODSP, I thought, of course, I'm doing this, I want a university, I got a job, I'll move on. And I remember as I went into the ODSP office, I was leaving, it was my final meeting with my case manager, and, and she looked at me with this smile that also belayed a darkness, a tragic darkness, and she said, you're the first person on my caseload who has left the program <laughs> because they had employment. And as I was leaving that office, I felt like I was leaving people behind. I felt that my friends that I had that were on ODSP who were not going to get off, I was leaving behind. And so I decided as I was leaving that office that 
I wasn't going to leave people behind, that I needed to work to ensure that people were not left behind. And so that caseworkers weren't able to celebrate one person leaving their <laughs> case for a load because they got a job, that they were able to celebrate everyone, those who were on their caseload and those who eventually did get off. Yeah. That's why I want to be here today. That's, uh, that's a good answer, Jeff. Thank you for that. A round of applause to Jeff's answer. Uh, Cheryl, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what you do for your work and, and you, you're focused on supporting people with, 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 with mental, who need mental health assistance and, and vulnerable populations. What changes have you seen as far as where people are at on this in this space and in the, in the few decades that have been doing this here? I, I've seen a lot. And it's not to say that it used to be easy mm -hmm. uh, because we know uh, people with uh, mental illnesses, including addiction, are the most, and World Health Organization worldwide, it's not just Canada, are the most discriminated group in society. Uh, so when it comes to issues such as who do you want to hire? Who do you want to rent to? Who do you want your daughter to marry? Mm -hmm. uh, this, is the this is the bottom of, your, of the list. And so people have systematic uh, barriers uh, and, and we, we see that all the time. But uh, when, I, when I had worked previously, one of the reasons um, I went into research to, uh, is that so often part of my work was trying in very difficult clinical situations, how can we do a workaround to make the system work for this person? Um, because there's, some, there's something about it where the system's just not working. And you come to a point where it's maybe... We, we, we instead have to change the system. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't have to look for loopholes all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's basically what we're constantly looking uh, for, for uh, loopholes to try to have some semblance of it working. Um, but when, even though there were those difficulties, uh, when I was first working as an advanced practice nurse, we had the same form that we would use if someone was discharged into homelessness as a patient assault. Because uh, and it was so rare. Once we got into the situation with the downloading from the federal government to the provinces uh, of housing, with responsibility for housing, actually the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have that at the national level. And we talk about human rights. Uh, housing is a human right. Canada has signed on to the UN proclamation of housing as a right. Um, and then in Ontario, we thought, well, that's a really bad idea. Let's see if we can download it further to the municipalities. <laughs> With even less flexible tax income. Yeah, yeah and, great. And we'll give municipalities the option to opt out entirely. Yeah, cool. Good idea. Yeah. So it, 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 when, when you look at some of these policy changes, it's not... Why are people with mental illnesses, including addiction, overrepresented in the homeless population and in poverty? It's how could you possibly expect any other outcome? Um, and keep in mind, this was also happening during the period of deinstitutionalization. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to that Mike Harris days when we're talking about yep. it getting worse since, that was a 25% cut in people's um, public assistance at that point. Um, so anyway, the, the, the changes I would say, um, we had been making some progress, especially places like London that had been working very hard on evidence-based approaches. Shortly before the pandemic, our by name list was only around 300 people, now around 2,000. Uh, we ended up with uh, um, the double whammy of, of the increasing, which just started before the pandemic, the increases in um, the housing costs, which of course increases the rental market, and at the same, and it interplayed with the pandemic in terms of people working from home, moving out into areas. Uh, the one study uh, we're just wrapping up. I went to every province and territory, 28 communities. Mm -hmm. We interviewed 400 people experiencing homelessness. Almost all of them, like, um, it like was over 90 percent had a diagnosed mental illness. Um, and, uh, um, and, and similarly, many of them, that would also include uh, uh, su substance use. So it's very clearly an overrepresentation. It got worse everywhere. Um, we found communities that lost as many as six group homes uh, that were renovated 
uh, so that they could be sold on the public market with prices going up. I, I've never seen this kind of problem. People living in group homes for a decade on the street. I never, until uh, this last trip to, to, to visiting these communities, saw people with Alzheimer's and dementias on the street. Yeah. Um, uh, people with autism on the street. Uh, and I, I think we'll all agree, we don't want anyone uh, on the street, but, but I think this should be an embarrassment to all of us that in this country, this, these kinds of situations have happened mm -hmm. and, and are happening regularly. Yeah, uh, it, it is an embarrassment. And, and to, you, you referenced Elizabeth's comments earlier surrounding the, the Harris government, sort of where social assistance rates were at for them. During this past election campaign, and I, I yelled at at leaders, uh, when everyone except for the Green Party is on the right of Mike Harris on social assistance, that's bad. And that's where we were at during the campaign that we had last year. That, or, well, I guess two years ago now, it's 2024. But still, that's, uh, that's a negative sign for this province, and I, it leaves me deeply concerned. Uh, Ashley, I want to ask you about your role with the Circles program and supporting people who receive Ontario Works and ODSP. When you're interacting with folks who are, who are on OW and ODSP, what are you seeing right now? Um, I th feel like the trends stay the same, just the circumstances become more dire mm -hmm. um, as the increase of everything goes up. Um, we are seeing a lot of housing crisis, people being evicted, um, and a lot of, like in our Circles program, we do a great job at trying to bring people in that can educate our participants on how to work the system and how to navigate, you know, you get that um, eviction notice, you don't actually have to leave or people are scared, they don't know. So that's a huge thing right now is people are like, oh, I have to leave and I have to do, find somewhere to live and I can't afford anywhere else right now. So that's a huge one. Food insecurity is huge. We like, they don't get enough money to buy healthy food. So they're having to eat unhealthy things which are causing them to have more health conditions. And then mm -hmm. they're in the hospital and, um, and it's really sad. Um, that's one thing that we do at our Circles program is we eliminate the barrier around food. So when we run our programming, we allow them to come, we eat together, they get to take leftovers um, and we provide childcare so that way they can come because childcare is another barrier for individuals who want to work or can work, but they don't have the access to childcare um, to do those things. Um, another thing that I'm finding is, you know, the stigma around it. People just don't feel deserving. They don't feel like they're a part of the community. Like I'm sitting up here today as someone who has been that person, who has sat in that role where I'm like, I'm a single mom with two young kids on the system, and I get, you know, looks and viewed as someone who's doesn't have their life together, and that's, that's not great for your mental health either. Mm -hmm. But so to be a part of the Goodwill Circles program, you're allowed to come to the program and sit at the table without that stigmatism and that judgment and just be seen as a person. So with my personal experience with that, that's just allowed our participants to feel valued and to give them that motivation to say, okay, this isn't me, this is the systems. This isn't because of who I am. This has nothing to do with that. It's the systems that are created to keep me in that. They're not, they're not created to allow growth, right. you know? So we see mothers that are, I wanna work, but if I work, I'm really working only to pay childcare. So right. it's not really, it's like, okay, you work now, we're gonna take from you, and there's no getting ahead for anybody. So there's no motivation. What's well, the point of it. finding a job if you have less money by the time you've gone exactly. to work? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, you've obviously done a lot of work surrounding this. Uh, you and I have talked on various platforms a lot about this sort of thing. When you're advocating for representation of people who have disabilities in our community, in our broader culture, what do you see when we relate that to the ODSP conversation? Yeah, so I, I've, I've sort of long joked that if I were to ever write a memoir, my memoir would be called The Only Wheelchair in the Room. Uh, <laughs> because often, in much of my life, I look around the room and I'm the only wheelchair in the room. Uh, it's a little on the nose, perhaps, uh, as a title. <laughs> but I think that when we, when we have conversations about anything, often we don't remember to talk about disability. That often disabled people are 
if they are included, they're an afterthought. They're an asterisk that's placed on the end of the conversation, which is conveniently exactly how we do accessibility. We build the building, and then we say, oh, shoot, we should actually put some ramps on this. We'll do it after it's more expensive. That's fine. Uh, we'll do it in uh, 2025. We'll be fully accessible by 2025. One more year. Uh, one more year, Ontario. Yeah. One more year. But then 2025 shows up, and eh, we'll see about 2027. Yeah, well, we'll see. AODA says 2025. But I think that when it comes to, to representation, we have this sort of belief that uh, disabled people don't exist. Or if they do, they exist somewhere else. And I think that's something that we really need to fight back on and change. We need to realize that at least 15% of the population has a disability right now here in, in Ontario. And that number is probably a lot higher uh, based on whether or not people disclose that they have a disability. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that in this room right now, there is a bunch of people with disabilities. And that for these individuals, their lives are probably not so much or not exclusively about the biological difference that they experience, but rather one of the big disabling factors is the society that they were born into. That we were born into a society that did not expect disabled people to be in this auditorium, that didn't expect disabled people to be on a stage like this, that didn't expect disabled people to be in the workforce, to be on city council, to be in halls of power, to be in the courthouse. We've designed a, a world presuming that 15% of us simply will not exist. And so I say we need to make disability visible. We need to make disabled people visible in all aspects of our life, not just visible in the hospitals that we built for them, on the institutions that we built for them and then closed, to make them visible everywhere, in our social life, in our economic life, in our education mm -hmm. life. And that means we need to build a different world, fundamentally, physically, but also attitudinally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, applaud that. I, I, I've got a couple for the, the whole panel to answer, and, and we'll do a few, but uh, I want to make sure we have lots of time for, for questions from the audience, too. Uh, the first one, and this is, a, this is a big one, I want to start with, with Ashley on this one. We often hear that, well, if you're on OW or ODSP, you've chosen that. You've decided to not get a job. You kind of hit on that earlier. That's what I wanted to hear from you on, uh, on this first. Uh, there are a lot of barriers that if you're on OW or you're on ODSP, even if you want a job and you think you can go work and you've got a job lined up, there are reasons for you to not go get that job. That's part of the problem we're dealing with here. Yeah, um, it's definitely not a choice. No one chooses to struggle. No one's yeah. like, yeah, sign me up for that free money, but you really kind of survive I want to live it. in the deep poverty line. Yeah, like, no yeah. one says sign me up, you know. Um, if anything, it's like, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> this is not the place for me. It's not, it's not meeting my needs as a human being. So you really gotta try to work hard for that. And there are so many things that people have underlining that prevent them from getting to the, okay, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get a job, I gotta do these things, like mental health and access to those programs are just not there for people and that keeps them in poverty. Um, a lot of generations poverty is huge, um, but what we're finding is situational poverty has become very popular. There's a lot of people who lost their jobs during COVID. Where mm -hmm. do they have to go? It is a necessity to have a program like OW or ODSP for people to go to if they find themselves in those situations. Where would they go? They wouldn't be able to go anywhere. That needs to have a program that can sustain people until they're on their feet again and get to where they want to be. No one chooses poverty. You know, it, it's absolutely. Cheryl, anything yeah, you want to add there? I, yeah? I, I, I would like to speak to this as, as well because if think think of the darkest day of, of your life when when some really horrible thing happened when you didn't know if you're going to make it to the next day. How would you feel if anyone suggested to you that was your choice? No. Uh, and very often, even the language around choice can be very triggering. Uh, for, for, for people. And I, re I remember when, um, when I was first starting to do research uh, in the area, particularly around homelessness, and uh, because we do participatory action research, uh, there's m many people with lived experience that were helping us design that. And they were very clear, you got to also ask questions around early childhood trauma and abuse. Um, it, it's often kind of like the... Um, 
elephant in the room in terms of what's going mm -hmm. on. People don't have the same support systems. They've got, they come through a, a traumatic past. I remember when I went to research ethics with that, they were going, oh, I don't know if you should be asking that question. Uh, people might be traumatized um, by even hearing the question. Uh, so they ended up, we had to set up a 1-800 number that if anyone after the interviews was traumatized, they could call us back and we could get some support for them. Interestingly, um, people were thrilled we asked that question. Many people said they had never been asked that and they felt it was very critical. Mm -hmm. Not a single person called that 1-800 number about that, but we did have people call the 1-800 number. And the, and the question was, are you living where you want to be living? And people who were homeless, we would only have maybe one or two percent say they made that choice. And again, this is another group that, oh yeah, people choose to be homeless. The people that called us were the people who had said it was their choice because they said they thought about it. And they said, I often will say that to live with it because to, to have to say that this has been done to me is just that painful. Uh, but even, even then, I say most people who are homeless said they very much wanted a home, but in some years, every, and we interviewed 300 people a year for five years, in some years, every single person who said they chose it actually called that 100 number and said, I wish I hadn't said that. Yeah. Elizabeth, you look like you really want to get in on this. <laughs> you were down. Well, because it, it, am I on? You're on now. <laughs> Good. Um, because it's so important, because it's such a huge stereotype. It, yeah. It's such an assumption, and I think that there's so many elements of the system, and Ashley, you touched on some of it, that are, are systematically keeping you down. So you, you go there, it should be poverty prevention, and then it becomes poverty, um, what do you call it, but it continues on. A, yeah, yeah. Thank you, perpetuation. <laughs> Audience participation, this is good. <laughs> a little early, but we take it. It's yeah. good, no, it's yeah. very good. Uh, but it perpetuates it, and, and there's elements of how the, the program is designed that, that keeps you there. So first of all, the, the deep inadequacy. So how do you look for a job when you can't afford rent, when you're not fed well enough to, to, have, to have the energy to put your mind to it? Maybe you can't afford the phone or the internet connection or the clothes that you need for the interview, all of those elements that go into that step out, it's really almost impossible. And then maybe you do get that job, but it's the clawback that's going to be the disincentive. And actually, you don't want to end up at zero, and this happens to sometimes to, to people with disabilities if they, they have to first avail themselves of CPP, uh, disability, if they are able to, but then if they don't have at least a dollar coming from Ontario Works, they lose all the medical health benefits that come with Ontario Works. Mm -hmm. So th there's just so many impossible turns within it and, and I, when we were talking about homelessness, it also reminded me of, of a series of conversations we had about a year ago. We, we undertook consultations for the City of Toronto. They were, um, as part of their commitment to the right to housing, building out what the roles and function of a housing commissioner would look like. And so we went into communities to, to test the idea and hear from people what their issues around housing rights were. And we, were, we did one with a, at a, at an Indigenous men's residence. And, and one gentleman, it stuck with me, he said, you know, I, am, I have been clean and sober for 60 days, and I, I am so proud and good and feeling strong. Good. And the only place that they can give me housing is at Dundas and Sherburne. Now, in Toronto, Dundas and Sherburne is, is where there is just everything there. He yeah. said, I won't stay sober for a day. Uh, you know, I, that's, I, but that's the only place they'll give me to yeah. live. And I know what's going to happen to me. So, so those are impossible situations. They're impossible decisions. And so is that a choice? Yeah. I've talked to people uh, who've been told, okay, just go live at the Salvation Army here in London. And look, the Salvation Army, there's a lot of great people there. They're, they're doing the best they can with what they've got. But they've said to me, look, I've, I've been trying to kick opioids or whatever it is for, for this amount of time. Th there are people just doing it in the hallway randomly. If I'm, if I'm having to walk past that every day, what chance do I have? Like, it's tough to kick addiction. So like, it just, yeah, it, it's, uh, we're, we're making it deliberately difficult on people. And then we wonder why the system fails. It's because we're making it harder than it needs to be. I wanted to touch on what you said about how you brought up a conversation. If you're like, oh, don't say that. Don't talk about trauma and what people have mm -hmm. gone through. Well, unfortunately, poverty is 
traumatizing. And unfortunately, it's uncomfortable to hear, you know, especially when you haven't lived it. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear about that. But it's supposed to make you uncomfortable because you're supposed to not be okay with that. You're supposed to be like, that's not acceptable for people. And even children, you know many children in London live in poverty, not by choice, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. They're not choosing that. The system should be designed to help alleviate that for those children so that way they can right. reverse that generational curse. Um, you know, earlier today, funny enough, before I came, I saw uh, a news um, on the TV and it was a gentleman in Ontario I'm not sure where but he was living on ODSP and he was in he, chronic pain he can't work and he said that he applied to be on MAID mm -hmm. which is assisted yeah. uh, you know dying and um, his reasoning was because I'm in such chronic pain I can't live any I can't live on the streets and his home is being sold he's got nowhere to go and for $1,200 a month he can't afford to live anywhere else so he said well my choice is that yeah. I would rather that than to be homeless. Now, if we're talking about choice, that has to have some impact on you to hear that someone who is really struggling would say, I would rather not be here at all yeah. because the system doesn't see me as a person. The, it's, the city doesn't see me. And who cares? It costs less to allow me to do that than to actually support me, mm -hmm. which no. is really, really sad. And that should make you feel uncomfortable by hearing that, you know, and it should make you say, what can I do to change that? And Je part of the, it's, it's their choice is a, is a way of separating people out. Like, they're not like mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a self-selector. So yeah, therefore, yeah. I didn't select that, yeah, so yeah. I'm not going to be in that they, spot. We yep. don't have to worry about those people who are not like me. And um, I, I think part of the compassion and understanding the situation, just going back to what Ashley was saying, is how many of us are that close and we have to understand this is about us mm. this is a, 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 this is about people um, but uh, but I think it, it's easier to play those games ourselves sometimes to say oh it doesn't count they're not like us they've made bad choices yeah uh, Jeff, what, what Ashley said about MADE there made me think of conversations you and I had on the radio years ago when MADE first came in and you said like look there are people in the disability community who are really concerned that this might be the way this goes. And that eventually, this is multiple levels of government working at the same time here, but eventually got to the point where, oh, you don't have a lot of money and you're disabled, eh? Have you thought about killing yourself? Like, that was the, the implication for multiple levels of government. So you kind of you nailed that years ahead, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate uh, to be burdened with this, uh, this foresight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're cursed, my friend. I, I hate to say it, and, and all you can do, I think, in some ways is laugh, because at the moment, what we're putting people into is like the world's worst choose-your-own-adventure yeah. book that's ever been created, um, because the choices are stay on this system, which does not provide you enough to live, or try to leave the system, but if you're someone like me with an electric wheelchair, you now need to get a job with the insurance mm -hmm. that's going to be able to pay for the repairs. You know, $500 for the batteries once a year for this wheelchair. This wheelchair is $30,000, which 75% of it gets covered. But there's 25% of that that does not. That comes back to the individual. Now, if you're on ODSP, that gets covered. But if you leave ODSP, you, if you accept the job, you get a job, mm -hmm. you're not on ODSP anymore and your insurance doesn't cover it, you're now responsible for that. So you have to make enough to pay for the ODSP and to pay for a wheelchair that you otherwise would have gotten covered. Precisely, for the 25% portion. Right. Uh, and that doesn't include upkeep, right? Right. And so you're at this point where you have to make this decision. And I would argue, and a lot of academics are starting to argue, that things like made, placing made in first, is putting the cart before the horse. Because rather than give people the ability to live, giving them the things that they need to live, and not just survive, but to live. We've instead given them the choice to die. And for me, I would call that eugenics. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a fair way to characterize it, and it's, it's, a, it's a negative, nasty word, but I think it fits the definition. Well, so. and now they're allowing the scope to go to mental people with mental health right. for made a program as well. So it's like, that's only gonna get worse you know and this gentleman has that i saw he's already gotten one doctor to sign off on it and he literally told the doctor well i'd rather not be homeless and the doctor was like sure 
Well, <laughs> like that's here's, just awful. Here's an alternative. Yeah. Well, here you go. <laughs> you know, like that's just awful. Uh, and uh, going back to your disability exa uh, example in terms of costs, in terms of the medication, um, psychiatric medications are extremely expensive. It's not uncommon for somebody to have seven, eight hundred dollars a month uh, in um, psychiatric, just to pay for the psychiatric medication. So. Um, I mean, the thirty thousand is a lot. The five hundred for the battery, but think, but think of what that means to give that up to go for a. So, how high of an income you have to get to come out even? Yeah, uh, the quote. I think it was Ronald Reagan who may have offered this. For, it could have been anybody, but it's a, it's a negative quote. the The best social program is a job. Oh God. Was it Reagan? Okay, good. <laughs> I got it right. Uh, either way, it's, uh, it's become something that politicians in Canada and the U.S. at the very least really like to repeat. Does anyone have any thoughts about that quote and why perhaps that would be misguided logic? <laughs> well, what good's a job if you don't have somewhere to live? <laughs> good point. A, you know, How are you going to maintain a job, a job if you don't, you don't have, have access to, to health care? Yeah. You know, like having a great job, yeah, that's awesome. And like the work that we do with people, we meet them where they're at. And some of these people are just like realizing, hey, you know, I, I'm struggling with mental health or addictions or I just haven't had the best upbringing or I've dealt with a lot of trauma in my life or I have nobody. There's a lot of people with nobody. That, and, and, and Circles is great at allowing people to have somebody in their corner. And when they're going through something, our participants can come to us and say, this is what I'm going through. And then we are allowed to brainstorm with them and allow, you know, work together to find a solution for their issue. And then they're like, well, you know, I didn't think that was possible. And most people don't realize things are possible. And like when you're alone, you know, that's, that's isolating. And to, it, a job just isn't going to fix that. You need a network. You need a support system in place to keep you you know, in that stable job and in that stable mental health. Yeah. And, and imagine trying to get a job um, when, you do, as you said, you don't have an address, you don't have a phone where they can leave a message. What is it, ODSP? Or ID. Yeah, or ID. Yeah. Yeah. One tooth a year, uh, you can get treated, but, it, but if, if you go over, it's easier they can pull it. So now you've lost your teeth. You might be 30 years old, but you've lost your teeth. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you, and you can't afford your clothes for that job interview. Um, how, how well do you think that's going to go? Not particularly. No. Yeah, I, this quote really frustrates me uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I think from a, like a very glib uh, way of phrasing it is um, I don't think that life should be about jobs, no. frankly. I don't know that I was born on this earth to work for someone. <laughs> and if that's how we want to structure our world, mm -hmm. yikes. <laughs> so the, on that, we'll put that aside. But I think a little bit more seriously, there's the reality. A lot of people will look at me and they'll say, Jeff, you got off ODSP. Anyone can do it, right? <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> all you need is a PhD, folks. That's all you need. <laughs> oh, that's that easy. Things. All right. That's yeah. just that yeah. easy, folks. Um, there are a lot of people on ODSP who cannot work. No. They can't for a variety of reasons. And again, not getting into the choice thing. This isn't about choice. This isn't about morality. This is about bodies. This is about minds. And for some people, they're not able to work. Mm -hmm. And that ODSP as a program was originally formed with these people in mind, that there are people who cannot be a part of the economic system that runs our country, and those people should not be left behind. Right. And so jobs are not the solution for everyone. And frankly, with the current minimum wage, jobs are not the solution for basically anybody, unless they're good paying jobs, livable wage jobs. So yeah, give us a little wage and maybe we'll talk. And, and, and you mentioned there are people that can't work. Uh, there are people that probably could work 15, 20 hours a week and may want to, but the system penalizes them for doing it. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember, yep. right, is that as you're working, you do get money clawed yep. back. And those clawbacks start soon. So who wants to pay to go to a job? Aggressive. Right. Well, I mean, ODSP just recently switched it where you can make $1,000 right. before they start deducting, which is great. 
Yeah. They need to do the same for OW because that's an incentive. You know, when you start working and you start seeing the change and the positiveness and you're, you know, getting out there, a lot of people have social anxiety because mm -hmm. of the stigma that they live with and fear of people knowing, oh, I'm on assistance. And for year, for the longest time, I didn't tell anybody yeah. anything. I was like, you can just assume whatever you want. You're not going to know. I'm not going to actually tell you that I'm on social assistance. There's no way, you know. And it took me a long time to be able to accept my story because it's not... You know, like I said, it's not the choice that I made, and it's not because of me as a person. I had to learn that, you know, my story might help somebody else realize, like, it's not you. It's the system, and you can you can make change for yourself if you if you can um, if you look out for those supports. So, yeah. Elizabeth, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I think everyone's kind of covered it, okay. um, but I, I, I do want to echo some of some of what's been said because I think it's really important, and it's it's that. Um, What's dangerous about that statement is that it's partially true. You know, it is good for people to be able to be productive where they are able to, where they have the capacity to, and where they are supported to get to it. But all of the systemic things that have been talked about are the things mm -hmm. that make it incredibly difficult or problematic to push people toward that. Um, and I think Jeff's point around decent work is hugely important. We have an employment uh, standards regime in Ontario that is is pitiful. You know, we, sick days, minimum wage, people on minimum wage are, are, are not making the, the market basket measure line. Like, we have got to look at what our employment standards are and ensure that that becomes a viable option. I think people do want to be productive and, and contributing, but it has to be with the right uh, context and circumstances. If you look, one, one last play, if you want to look at the welfare in Canada numbers for this year, you will see that Quebec outperforms everyone else because they are actually building in real uh, employment opportunities around the, around the, the welfare. But, it, but you know, we have to look at it really carefully so that it doesn't become a, a forced or that, that it is really providing conducive, supportive opportunities and stepping stones to employment and then to employment that is going to be fair, decent. Uh, I'll, I'll ask each of you this. Uh, if there's one thing that you wanted someone to take away from this conversation or someone uh, from outside of the community to take away, uh, outside of this room, but they're watching it on, on television or hearing about whatever it is, to take away from this conversation, what would you want them to take away? And I'll start with Jeff on that. Uh, I, think, I think something that's really important uh, for people in this room, people that are watching after the fact, is to understand that they have power. They have power to influence this in both micro and macro ways, that they have the power to change the way that they think about poverty and to think about people living in poverty, to, think, to change the way that they see people that are living downtown. Think about those conversations that you hear in your day-to-day -day life when you hear people talking about, oh, those people downtown. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't like going downtown now because those people are there. Yep. Let's put a big underline under the word people a huge underline under that. Let's remember that we have power when it comes to talking to the politicians that come to your door, or even better, you going to their offices. Go to their door and talk to them about the type of Ontario that you would like to see, the type of Canada that you would like to see. You have the power to change this. It is a huge problem, but we're not powerless. Ashley, what about you? Um, I feel like you know, we all have different experiences and we might, you know, we all have, you know, traumatic things or like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through that? Um, I want people to think about when you encountered those moments, who was there for you? You know, what supports did you have in place? And if you didn't have those, where would you be? Do you think that you would still have outcome, you had a good outcome or would you have ended up you know, needing something like this programming. You know, it's very easy to just keep living our lives day to day, nine to five, and, and just forgetting about everybody else. But, you know, like I said, it, we are all just one crisis away, really, like a lot of us from, hey, if that happened to me today, what would I do? I'm, now I'm also in the same situation. So if you would want someone to value you as a human being or see you as someone that is a, a member of the community that needs support, then you should also view those people that you're saying, those people down there or, you know, um, and stigmatizing people. Just don't judge people without knowing because everyone comes from a lot of things that you're not aware of. Yeah. Cheryl? So...
I, I think I would like people to take away, instead of focusing on the flaws of individuals, their perceived flaws, to be thinking of it as a systematic issue. Uh, and I've often used the analogy of the uh, game of musical chairs to help understand this. Uh, and if we think of the game of musical chairs, that the people circling the chairs are the people who are living in poverty, people who are on OAS who only as their source of income, or uh, Ontario Disability, CPP, Ontario Works. And, and we heard the numbers of what they would have, uh, mm -hmm. what they could actually afford in terms of housing. And then the chairs in the game represent the actual housing that would be available for somebody at that level. Yep. Uh, and when you think of it that way, it's quite obvious if you have a system where you're going to create more people circling and only have a few chairs, uh, you, you're going to have um, not only poverty issues, which is the people circling, you're going to have homeless issues. Uh, and and we will create, but these are systems issues. It's not about the individual people circling the game. Um, th th that n the difference in those numbers is going to create the problem. Elizabeth, you want anything you want to add to that? I, I think that the only thing we haven't really touched on is, and in, in, we've talked a lot about how the system impacts people and, and creates poverty and recreates poverty, and other lots of systems. We didn't, we haven't touched mm -hmm. the criminal justice system. Yeah, we've talked health, a bit about the health, housing the whole system. Thing, yep. um, but th there's also other s systemic uh, system systems of discrimination. And so the intersections of people's lived experience of racism, of colonialism, intergenerational trauma. So when you, you say, when you look at people and, and don't judge, what we have no idea of the, the many, many intersections of discrimination, of how they have interfaced with, with these um, programs and with life, with the educational system. Mm -hmm. Who's being pushed out in grade one and grade two? That's happening, and it's happening mm -hmm. to young black boys. What's happening? So you begin to look at all of these other places, and this is what's shaping people's experiences. And then we say, you made bad choices. So, yeah. so there's a lot of complexity to this, and um, I think just being comfortable, I think the takeaway is it's complex. Yeah. We it's, put people down a well and then look down there and say, what are you doing down there? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not, it's not a good way to run the system. Uh, as you all know, we're talking about Make It Livable, uh, that initiative, and that is the, the hope to bring voices forward to the provincial government. In messaging to the province, what do you think politicians and bureaucrats who are making these choices should be hearing? What's, what's the key messaging for them, Jeff, do you think? Oh. <laughs> that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think the message that I would have uh, from people working in the provincial government uh, is to really look at this as not something that is solved tomorrow, but rather something that you need to be looking five years ahead, 10 years ahead, that you don't need to be thinking about right now. Because the problem with right now thinking is that you miss this kaleidoscope of issues. The other issue we're thinking right now is that you look at a price tag right now, and you don't think about how spending a bit of money today is actually going to be saving us money downstream. Yeah. That how taking care of people today helps reduce costs in housing, reduce costs in um, the judicial system, reduce costs really Healthcare. across the board. Yeah. So I've put that to, uh, to the premier before, and. Uh, 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 well, I tried to talk to him today, but he wasn't taking questions. Uh, but I put that to the Premier before and, and various uh, other politicians before who have been in office. And the, the, the answer is always, it's complicated, but I'm going to be a cynical guy and say, you don't want to pay now to solve the problem for when somebody else is in office. So that's, that's part of the problem, right? Is that right. You, as someone else who's the, the next Premier, the next party in power, is going to reap the benefits of what you've decided to do. And that's been part of the issue here. Right, and maybe it's time that we need to stop being political entities and start yeah. being people. Yeah, good idea, <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, I, I agree. I feel like 
the messaging should just be, you know, we're human. And to live in Canada, a place that so many people think, I'm going to go there and I'm going to live a great life. Well, the Canadians are not living a great life Mm -hmm. uh, currently. So we need to do something about that. We need to get back to that standard of Canada is a great place to live for everyone, not just for the people who made the good choices, uh, you know, to get jobs. You know, um, we really need to focus on human rights and the fundamentals and the basic needs of everyone. I would remind people we, we kind of had a basic need experiment uh, with the CERB. Uh, and, uh, I mean, bad ending uh, and, and rapid <laughs> ending, but let's get st- step back from that. But that was actually the first time in decades we had a reduction in the poverty rate. Um, so it's not that we don't know what the solution is. It's not that we don't have the evidence what the solution is, uh, but we have to have the will to say it's not acceptable to not implement a solution that we know will work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, anything you wanted to add to that? <laughs> we've, got, we've got a couple minutes, so feel free to, uh, feel free to expand. I mean, it's just, it's just difficult to figure out what will be compelling. Yeah. Because it, because there's been very deliberate decisions made. Yeah. And so you can appeal uh, that it's a violation of human rights. We just had a universal periodic review that looked at Canada and said, you are violating human rights on the basis of income security. That's what we got back. Mm-hmm. And what are we going to do about it? We're going to ignore it. We yeah. have governments that, at the federal and provincial level that just say, mm, not justiciable. That's not really our thing. So, so it, I, I, um, yes, I think it is about paying today. It's about, it's about investing in people, and I think it's the turning it around. It's not a problem. These are people. They are our communities. Invest in them. It's investing in them. It's investing in our own future. Yeah. Well, and it's a top issue for so many people right now, so you would think that this would be the time to strike while the iron is hot, just from a, a cynical political perspective, like, okay, we're doing something real about poverty. Where is it? You know, like, it's just, it, it's not coming. Uh, are we ready to do Q&A, do you think? Let's do that. All right. So uh, we're happy to hear from, from anyone in the audience who, who has questions for, for anyone on the panel. Yeah, we'll get the lights on so we can see what we're doing here. Uh, right. Please raise your hand. Uh, a member of the United Way staff will come over with a microphone for you. You can uh, ask whatever question you may have, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. It's suspension rates, um, suspension and expulsion rates in, in, in elementary schools. Um, I think it was uh, an academic from KW that had shared it with me, but uh, we, had, we had a working table with people for education that was looking at some of this stuff. And it's, it's if you look at, at racism in the school system, and this, this was from a previous life of mine years ago when I, I, I did research at OISE, it is embedded throughout the school system. And you begin to see it, it's in subtle ways, and then it's in not so subtle ways. And it's the way that discipline is, is looked at. It's the way that behavior is interpreted by teachers. You're in this space, so you know what I'm, I'm talking about as well with youth. Um, and so I, I don't have the, the, the academic reference off the top of my fingertips. I, I can get it. Um, and and I, I also, years ago, we did a fair amount of work on um, black high school students being pushed out of the school system. And it's, it's everything from streaming. Streaming has had a, a, just a detrimental impact on racialized communities, disproportionately on black males. Not because they were black, because their behavior then qualified them for suspension. Because, so so it, it's, I gave it a very glib, uh, uh, glib description, but it is about how behavior gets interpreted, how behavior is, is disciplined, and what results from that. It wasn't be- it's well, never because you're black. It, 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 get, it gets coded in other things. It can't be called that, right? That's the it, reason. It's coded for disciplinary issues and behavioral issues and so forth. 
If I can add to this, uh, there's another example of this. Um, there's some researchers in the States, and this is about the United States context, but it applies to Canada as well. Um, they're doing work what they call DISCRIT, um, so D-I-S-C-R-I-T. Uh, that's the name of the book, if you want to look it up. But um, part of the research shows how um, particularly young black boys get streamed into uh, special education programs um, because they're deemed as having a mental disability or a learning disability uh, and are then shot off because, as these researchers would argue, um, racism and racial bias have them look at the student and say, you're a troublemaker, you're a danger, I need to get you out of here, in a way that they don't typically respond to white boys of the same age. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's take another question. Hi, I'm Dan. Hi, Cheryl, Jeff, okay. and, and the others at home, I'm sorry. But, uh, oh, yeah. We now have a national suicide line, 988, and in six weeks, medical assistance in dying will be extended to the mental health community. So, Jeff and Cheryl, I know you both have opinions on that, and the other two, I'm, I'm sure you uh, have something to say about that. Could you, as a panel, or individually, speak on that, please? Yes, oh, th thanks, Dan. Um, well, I, I think it really does relate to a lot of what we're talking about in terms of leaving people without hope. Um, and and uh, I, I, I'm glad that there is a line and someplace people can reach out for help. Um, but again, we, we also have to look at what are the systems we've created that often put people in this situation. It's often not just about depression. Um, it, it's about being in a depressed situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that I would add to that is um, we need to remember that mental health care is health care. And if we genuinely believe in Canada, in universal health care, that needs to extend to mental health care as well. I, I would like to say that the access to those type of programs are just not there for people. So there's a lot of individuals who are facing depression and all different types of mental health that are like, I don't have the the necessary tools to combat what I'm feeling. And then they just start to go down this rabbit hole. And now you're saying, hey, well, look at, here's an out for you. And that out starts to look really good for somebody who's really struggling without supports. So there needs to be more support for people who are really going through it. But mental health care is off in recent years, pretty much decades now, has been really rationed for people with serious and persistent mental illness. So that would be like if in cancer care, they said, wait till you're stage four, and then we'll, and then we'll offer treatment. Um, we, we do need for people who are very, have serious illnesses to have care, but we also need early intervention. We also need prevention. Um, and uh, when you look at healthcare, like a lot of the counseling services are, are still at a fee for service level, whereas we do not accept that for physical healthcare. Um, one of the things mentioned just in terms of uh, technology, um, and one of the differences, again, with mental illness uh, compared to physical illnesses. Um, and so, because we've been looking at, I, th I think when the disability legislation was put in place, people couldn't imagine that people could support their memory, support their organization through things like a cell phone, uh, which probably most of us do rem remember to get here tonight, right? <laughs> um, but the, the, um, the Provincial Disabilities Act specifies it's only for physical illness. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is actually it's right in the legislation. It's excluded, no. which, which again should be a charter issue. We're not supposed to discriminate based on the basis of the type of illness. Yeah, uh, and, and getting back to to what you said, I, I've said it about this conversation many times. When it comes to the criminal justice system, when it comes to the healthcare system, the ounce of prevention being worth the pound of mm -hmm. cure, mm -hmm. and we are letting the ounces of prevention fly by, and then we wonder why there isn't enough cure to go around. Uh, next question. Actually, a couple of questions, but I'll just start with. Um, does Ontario have the money to double Ontario Works? And if not, 
with the United Way saying, what do we want the provincial government to do to double the income? Uh, whoever wants to, to take that yeah. one, go ahead. Okay, go no, you go. You go. Okay, I'll, I'll go really quick. I promise. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal something from uh, a mentor of mine, a professor of mine, who um, said something really brilliant when I was an undergrad, and it stuck with me uh, all these years later. And he said, you know, the measure of a society. If you want to know what a society genuinely cares about, look at what they spend their money on. Where do you spend your money? Where does the government allocate your funds? And so if you look at the United States, and the United States might say things like, we care about freedom, and we care about liberty, uh, he would argue, well, mm, you care about the military, because that's what you spend your money on. That's where you put your dollars. And so I think when it comes to this question of do we have the money, I think the Ontario government will absolutely say, well, we just don't have the money, and gosh darn, we have these giant budgets, but we just, shucks, we don't have the money uh, to pay for it. That's, oh, geez. Um, but maybe we should do a few more tax cuts. Anyone? Tax cuts? <laughs> well, corporate tax cuts. Let's do that, maybe. <laughs> so I think that when, when all is said and done, is it going to cost a lot of money? Absolutely. But right now, in Ontario, we spend a lot of money on a lot of stuff. Including the court system, which you would not potentially, the studies would say you'll spend less money on if there are fewer people in poverty, including the healthcare system, which you will certainly spend Absolutely. less money on if there are fewer yeah. people in you'll poverty. You'll reduce all those things if people yeah. have basic needs yeah. uh, met, right? Because yeah. people are living fight or flight consistently on a daily basis. How can you go get a job when you have to go to this food bank, and then you have to go to that one tomorrow, and then you have to go to the next one, and you can only go to those once a month, yeah. right? And then like you're trying to navigate getting one check for yeah. the whole month. I mean, how many people can say they can live off $733 a month? Nobody. Coordinating your meals and getting your money is a full-time job in and of kitchen. itself. Yeah, like yep. how are you going to be able to manage a job when you're just trying to survive? Yeah. Right. So you look at something like homelessness um, and someone in that situation, I mean, honestly, like even when I've looked at homeless youth, if you looked at the number of medical conditions, you would think you were talking about a geriatric population. Um, like it, it's, it's astounding how sick people get. And so depending on the study, four to 10 times more likely to end up in the emergency room and depending on the illness, generally about twice as long as in hospital. And think of the cost um, each day somebody is in hospital. Mm -hmm. a, a single day it, it can often be for at the cheapest, but more likely eight hundred, a thousand dollars a day. It's a month for somebody. Yeah, compared to pe yeah. paying for rent and getting the getting yeah. them settled. Uh, when you talk about the judicial system and the cost of yeah. it's uh, imprisoning someone, it's even higher. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like pay me now or pay me later. Um, and and again, there's a lot cheaper ways of dealing with that, like getting people out of poverty, making yeah. sure they have appropriate housing. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, we're not saying that, oh, the, the judicial system goes away. Very, very no, wealthy no. people commit crimes. However, uh, there will be, you know, presumably these like little piddly things that people go through the system yeah. for, and you're paying lawyers, and you're paying yeah. uh, jail and court dates, you know, stuff like yeah, that. The, the, no. there, there's a criminalization of many sure. of these populations, yep. but particularly around um, homelessness, for p people standing on the street, for uh, like, uh, you know, ma for many different things that are part of the experience of homelessness end up criminalized, and then you pull them into an extremely expensive system. Um, rather than, again, when you compare those costs to the cost of having a decent income and decent housing, include, including decent housing. Let's fit one last question in before we wrap up. Um, I was going to say, it's been my work, a uh, pleasure being here today. But I would like to know how we, um, we can work with you on this issue, that it is a really important issue that is affecting many of us. Well, you know, that's kind of perfect, because Kelly was just about to come onto the stage and tell us exactly that. So let's do that. Good segue. <laughs> 
So I swear that wasn't a plant, but <laughs> a, that was a really excellent question. So um, my name's Kelly Zigner. I'm the president and CEO of United Way Elgin Middlesex, and I am um, really moved and honored to see so many of you here today to listen to our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues talk about this really critical issue. So first off, sincerest thanks to Jeff, Ashley, Cheryl, Elizabeth, and Craig. Big round of applause. You um, brought really important perspectives to this conversation, whether it be your lived experience, um, the experience of talking to people who are experiencing these issues, um, academic information, uh, all very, very important for us to hear. Um, and you know, our call to action right now aligns with the, um, the call for submissions from the provincial government regarding um, the next year's budget. So each year they come out to communities on their little roadshow and they say, what do you want to happen? Um, where should we be spending our money as a province? And um, we, for a number of years, have you know, said quietly, we write our letters, we send them in and say, we need to do something about social assistance rates. We need to do something about social assistance rates. And um, we decided that it was uh, time for us to get a little bit louder and to bring our community into this conversation because um, you know, one letter from you know, one uh, social service agency in London, Ontario uh, is not gonna have the same impact as um, community members saying that this is not okay. This is a violation of human rights. We've heard it from our guests here today. And so our call to action for the provincial government is going to be to double social assistance rates. And I, I should say, um, you know, that sounds like a lot, but doubling really is just bringing people to the poverty line. <laughs> it, it is not, you know, bringing people into a space where, um, you know, th that uh, they're thriving in their community. It's really just getting their basic needs met. So that's the first call to action. The second is to index those rates ongoing um, to the rate of inflation so that we don't get in this um, boat again and we have uh, people have access to a, a dignified income. And that's that really is our call to action um, for the government. And so what is our call to action for all of you? It is to um, be our megaphone, to go out into the community, to talk to your friends, to talk to your neighbors, to share on social media about what you heard here tonight, um, to share our website. Uh, we will be putting um, uh, up here on the, on the screen here is a QR code um, that drives you to a website where you'll see our letter that we're sending off to the province, um, and you'll have the ability to endorse those recommendations. And so our goal is to get as many people as possible endorsing those recommendations so that we can, one, make our submission to the provincial government, but then to turn around and say, this is important to people. This isn't just you know a bunch of social workers sitting around talking about how great this would be. This is important to um, every person in our province because we know, as, as Craig just said, you pay now or you pay later. And um, this, this deep abject poverty that we're legislating people into just simply cannot continue. And we need your support to help um, make it livable for our friends and our neighbors in our community. And I just went way off script, Deb, so I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope you're okay with that. Um, so uh, as you leave here today, um, you know, you, you take a picture of the QR code, you can uh, visit our website, unitedinaction.ca. We'll also have uh, a number of our United Way staff people out in uh, the hallway there who will have laptops set up. So if you wanted to just um, uh, endorse the re recommendations uh, with them tonight, you can also do that. And then um, really just get out there and help us spread the word. Uh, you're all champions for being here tonight and for, for listening, paying attention uh, to our friends and our colleagues. And um, be our megaphone. Help us make it livable. Thank you. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. I 
Our family used to be so fun. Now my brother takes care of me. I miss mom and dad being around more. Mom says things are going to get better. I am lucky to meet so many amazing women, and I hope they feel lucky to meet me. I'm ready. He's a hot sweetie. Chef's kiss. He's insane. I was mesmerized. Hey. I'm still just Joey. He's so handsome. The Bachelor, all new, Mondays 8, 7 central on City TV. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers Cable or Rogers TV. My name is Jessica Little and I'm a born and raised Londoner. So the last few years my clients have been asking me like if I knew a good tradesperson and I was just like, well, my, my dad is one, but he's just always so busy. So I decided I wanted to help my clients in the local community by finding and showcasing so kind, honest, trustworthy trades, people with accountability and prices that match their work. This is Trade Talk. I'm Jessica Little. On this week's episode of Trade Talk, I'm here with Mark Murphy from Home Shirt Inspections. How's it going, Mark? Very good. How are you today? Good. I'm glad we got to have a nice day to film in Spring Break That's Park. That's gorgeous, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I got to do it another day, too, so this was nice. So I just, um, my brother had to refer me to you yep. because he thought you had a lot of integrity and you've been doing this for a long time. And so anybody that my brother refers is obviously a good guy. Yeah, your brother's fantastic. Got to, right? to know yeah. you a little bit. So, yep. yeah. yeah. So I just kind of wanted to start with like how you got started and or your background previous to getting started with this. OK, mm -hmm. um, so my background is uh, was all has always been in construction. Um, so we were running a construction company and I met all the trades. I met some fantastic people, including your brother. Yeah. Um, and so we're doing that for about maybe about 10, 12 years. And then after that, I was working so much. I was like, you know what, I've got to, I started taking my courses to do my home inspection stuff. Oh, okay. So we did that. Um, and then I basically completed all my courses and decided just kind of one day, all right, I'm going to just do home inspections. Oh. I'm not going to do construction anymore. Was it just like too much? Like, it was have... too much, yeah, because we had we had two small children. We had a lot of, lot of time commitments. Okay. And when you're kind of managing running a, a, a construction company, you're out seven days a week if you're not meeting people then you're setting up quotes then you're you know following up with people trying to trying to get money and stuff like that so that's my dad too he's done it since i was a kid yeah so it's right just, it's so, 24 7 and 100 and you don't get a break and i did have commitments like for rugby and stuff like that for my kids oh okay. so i needed to be able to get out kind of two or three days a week and oh, they were doing seven. rugby and they were doing rugby also. and i was playing rugby and okay. then i was trying to help coach them as well so in construction, I found I just didn't have any time. Yeah. So I started doing home inspections. Um, it, it took off for me very, very quick. Oh, because um, did you, you had a lot of contacts? I had a lot of contacts and I knew real estate agents and stuff like that. So it really didn't take long for it to, to start to oh. like, I was a bit worried, right? Just going from a full-time oh, yeah. job to all of a sudden going, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm That's always do this. like a fear, right? Of course, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you never know, right? You're like, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to make enough money to feed, feed a family, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, just kind of basically one day just said, okay, stopping that. And we moved over to home inspections and it just took off. Oh, well, see, but it's good because it was a smooth transition because it was kind of in and around the things that you're doing. Like, 100%. You know, yeah, and because yeah. you actually have a, like that background with construction, that's like a perfect the, the, the When I was taking the courses, because I hadn't actually done any schoolwork or something <laughs> yeah. for quite a while. So when I was taking the courses, I was a little bit worried, but um, a lot of the stuff was just, I knew from second yeah. half from doing it every day of the week. Yeah. Um, there was every, something in each course where you learn, you're like, okay, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it was common knowledge to me. Well, and the thing is like with me, if I'm doing something, I learn more doing something. Right? Oh, so because on, you yeah. had done some, yeah. a lot of these things, you, you're like, oh, I get that. I understand. That. Yeah, 100%. Hands 
on is just the, for me it's the way to go it's the way okay to go. so you yeah. were saying like you do a lot of like um just people referring you is are you mostly referral basis referral stuff? based yeah um i've i've gotten to be friends with a lot of real estate agents in town yeah. um and a lot of them will hand out my name as long as, as well as a couple of other uh, home inspectors names okay. um just to make sure i let the client pick yeah. but also through um they have their own private chats and stuff like that yeah. a lot of times when when clients when other real estate agents go hey do you have a no good home inspector then my name will come up on that chat yeah. i'm not part of that chat so is but it I've like a it. facebook group chat or is it I like think they have internal group, messengers internal messaging their... too yeah okay. yeah there's different ones out there um okay. and i think the internal message one um for whatever reason my name just keeps coming up on it well you know the thing is is like with any job it's if you like have integrity yep and so they're referring you because you do a good job but you're also friendly because that like a lot of it has to do with your personality how you treat people your follow-through getting back to people all that kind of stuff so 100 you know, yeah. and I, I i do pride myself on that like i show yeah. up on time i'm personable i dress well you know like yeah. to do my job sort of thing um and also people can rely on me so yeah, yeah. i agree with you 100 percent there yeah and that's that's why my brother referred you because our family's like that like we're from the generation where a handshake meant something right yeah. so yeah. it's just like or just cut from the cloth of where a handshake meant something fair yeah yeah, yeah. so you sent me some pictures of some like crazy things yeah we saw that really weird receptacle one where what yeah. are, there's those and then there's a bunch of things what what are some of the crazy things that you see like so uh, i mean i come across all different things um some are like I, i'll give you an explanation so i went to home inspection there was a lady with me um and we went inside and i one of my, part of my job is to have a look at the electrical panel so i've got an insulated screwdriver i put it to the electrical panel to go open up the screw a screwdriver that goes through insulation no it's insulated sorry so okay. uh, the electrical current won't go through it oh, oh yeah. to take the panel to take okay, the panel yeah, cover okay. off so i went to take the panel cover off and i went to turn the screw and the, the electrical panel just went in a big shock like this and smoke started stepping out of it Oh, so naturally we step back yeah um and then another big spark and smoke came out of it again so, okay so we just turned the electrical off as we continued in this inspection um i was checking the attic space for her. so i knocked on the attic uh, i always knock on the attic because i don't want to surprise any animals yeah so i knocked on the attic door and i heard this i, I can only describe it as an ungodly squeal yeah <laughs> yeah Ooh. um and then i kind of waited and then i knocked on the attic door again and the same squeal to the point where the lady was just like okay i'm not buying this house she just walked out <laughs> oh my lord yeah so i did open the attic and it was i presume a raccoon they had left by the time after two knocks they decided to leave um but i presume it was a raccoon up there and they had been living up there for quite some time. oh my god and then there was that other weird receptacle that was plugged into another yeah it's so uh, i see a lot of different electrical things that homeowners maybe do that really shouldn't do like I'm yeah. big on uh, if you need a trade hire a good trade right yeah. but if you think okay I'm going to wire this box or I'm going to um I'm going to do this connection like it's it just you shouldn't be done yeah. right hire an electrician to do any electrical work it's just without without fault yeah. um that plug that you're referring to it was extended because it was the plug itself was deeper in the wall and yeah. it was extended out but it was so dangerous oh my god that I don't know how the house didn't burn down oh my god yeah it's just uh, yeah you cringe when you see stuff like that you know and you're just yeah. like oh my god and these people have done it like i was in an attic space once and there was a lot there was a wire sitting right at the top of the attic space and i could it wasn't live so i was like okay it's not live yeah but somebody just left it there yeah but i went down just to check and i turned on a few light switches and it made it live and it was sitting there just waiting it wasn't marred no oh my no. god no it was sitting there just waiting to oh my god something happened i mean electrical wires give off a hum and animals love to chew on it so if an animal starts chewing on it then oh we could get into big trouble okay yeah yeah, yeah. that's not good yeah yeah you don't want to so, get in trouble with anybody no you know i don't i don't want to get any trouble with electricity at all right so but that's the kind of just an idea of what what people do and it could have been three homeowners ago yeah right they've sold the house somebody else has moved in and they don't know that that's well, there but there was other wouldn't there have been other home inspectors pre previous like if it's been sold it a few times, you know, the or, the, or they didn't catch. Or they, or, oh wait, the market because the market was so yeah. crazy, there was like no conditions. There was no at conditions. Point, yeah, right? so oh, okay. it really does depend on the market, and yeah. um, some people just yeah, you home inspectors. Some home inspectors have got a bad name for themselves, yeah. so some people don't use a home inspector. They'll bring in a handyman or something like oh, that and have okay. them go through. And if they don't do the, the entire process, oh yeah, then there's likelihood they're going to miss something. So now people like at the time when covid was happening yep. what did that the, how did that 
uh, affect your business because a lot of people like there was no conditions people weren't using the inspections as much yeah um so what happened was um my next door neighbor is a good friend of mine um he's a real estate agent and him and i got together and, and we talked about it and we came up with the idea of a short inspection like a pre-offer inspection yeah you were talking about that yeah earlier, yeah right? so it takes an hour and basically we go through the house i'm going at, at very very fast i'm trying to get as many big ticket items as i can like yeah. foundation electrical plumbing yeah attic spaces um and it took an hour and then i'll give them a report as soon as i'm done and then at least you have a good idea as you're going into a competitive buying situation okay, well, I know I still need $5,000 for these repairs here. Yeah. Or, no, I'm good, the house is perfect, or the house is a disaster, I don't want to put an offer. And it would happen, it would happen, have to happen day of, right? Yes, yeah. Like, you'd have to be on the pulse and, like, waiting for the phone calls, right? Yeah, so yeah. I bet you, you got a lot that way. Then. I got an absolute, I got a, a ton that haywire. way. And some of the, I was very fortunate that I was able to help my clients with some of them as well. Okay, um, yeah. Like I'll sh I'll send you some pictures um, of one that we went into and it was a heavy competitive uh, house, and when I looked in the attic, uh, the attic was completely burnt. So there had been a fire, oh. and the current home homeowners knew nothing about it. Um, but basically, the joists when I went to look at them, the joists, the roof joists, were so badly damaged that it was going to cause trouble. Yeah, yeah. So oh um, luckily for my clients. I was able to show them that and then they were like, okay, we're not, we're not going to put a bid in this house yeah. because obviously we have to replace the entire roof system. Yeah. Um, but the house sold that day. See, that's so sad that like either it was COVID or other inspectors didn't catch those things. True. You yeah. know what I mean? So like, you've been doing it for a long time. So you're thorough with everything. Then, yes. Right? Yeah. And I have my process. So like, it's kind of, I, I'm doing this and do this and just kind of move through my list. Yeah. And I, it's, it's very thorough. Like I'm told by real estate agents, I'm very thorough. Yeah. I do more than the average home inspector does. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to do that way. I'm happy to take the time and make sure yeah. I, I don't want to make an error. So do you have other people that help you out and work with you and stuff like that? Too? It's, like it's funny. I've been asked that by some of the real estate agents that, that use me a lot. Yeah. Um, as I got busier, they'd ask me to, can I, you know, can I do this job? And I'm like, I don't have any time to do that for you. Sorry, can, okay. we, can we do it tomorrow or the next day? So they have actually asked me, it, could you, would you hire somebody? They've asked me to clone myself too, but uh, obviously we're not there yet. Um, would you? So, there's some interesting technology coming True, yeah. We're, I mean, well, maybe we're there, well, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. We won't talk about that. Right. That's another topic. Um, so in terms of that, I don't want to hire somebody else because I don't think they'd be able to give what I can give. And I'm not being, you know, I'm not putting myself up here. I'm just... I know how I interact with my clients. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm looking for. And if I was to hire somebody and have them do that, maybe even if I train them really well, maybe they they would they would take shortcuts there. They would miss something. Yes. So for now, I'm just saying a one man show. On yeah, that because hundred like percent, right? Yeah, that's the reason I don't hire too. I I, yeah. I decided to reject what I was doing because I just. I, I have the capacity to do that, but then I just can't monitor what everybody's 100%, doing, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you don't know if somebody's gonna try and take short shortcuts when you're not looking. Oh yeah, now that, that'd be devastating because what if something ha bad happened and you, you, you weren't, yeah, I yeah. totally understand. It's on me, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's on my company, I know, right? and your conscience. Yeah, right? yeah. But anyways, all right, so um, for the final question, I just wanna know, uh, do you have any tips and tricks for people if they're looking for a home inspector? Like what should they be looking out for? Well, I think look for somebody that's established. I think look for somebody that has a history and then definitely look for somebody that, uh, like, go do your research on them, uh, make sure they have a good Google profile, good go Google reviews um, to make sure that you've got the right person. Don't necessarily, like, some of the questions I get when people call me are, how much do you charge? Yeah. To me, that should be not the first question you ask. It, it should be, it's, it's obviously necessary to, to know, but it shouldn't, you shouldn't base it on, because I do believe I'm actually probably one of the lowest cost inspectors oh. in town, but that shouldn't be the question, that, that shouldn't be the first question you ask. It should be, what's your experience? Yeah. Um, do you, what kind of report do you have? Do you have any reviews? Can I talk to anybody that's maybe used yeah. you in the past that would give you I'd rather use somebody that, you know, regardless of price, like knows what they're doing. hundred percent, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? You don't want to cheap out when you're doing a big, huge pro project like that, buying a house and doing the It's thing. kind of one of the biggest pro yeah. things you will do in your yeah. life, expenses in your life. Yeah. You should make sure that the person that's advising you on it is gonna do a good job and yeah. has a history of doing a good job. Well, yeah, there's some things that you can do, like brand name ketchup or no name ketchup. Right. But not with home inspections. It's right. not okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to ask the, the price, obviously. Yeah, the yeah. price is, in, it is obviously a part of the equation. But for me, again, 
just uh, history and reviews and talking to other people, like talking to real estate agents yeah. and see who they recommend as well is obviously important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do your research. And that's how I found you is through my brother because yep. he had worked with you. So uh, I, and I found all of my guests for this show from my clients because it was all referrals, right? So yep. it was just like people that have dealt with these people and you trust them to give you the, you know, the right opinion on it. So like, yeah, it's good. Okay, so as the final part of the show, you either have to do a handshake or a dance. Which one would you choose? Uh, I don't know about my dance moves, so let's do a handshake. Okay, all right. Okay, sounds good. Okay, you ready? Get that drone off the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're for very coming. welcome. Awesome. This is brilliant. I did it. I need it. A hero gave it. And I am alive. As an organ donor, you can save up to eight lives and enhance the lives of 75 others. Please go to our website. Pledge a gift of life. You'll be glad you did. Think, think before, before, you say, before it. you say it. Don't wind up like me. Imprisoned by your tongue, doing one to three. Is that good behavior? You gotta think, think before, before you say before it. Before you say it. Cause somebody's gonna hear. You ain't kidding. I'll make it plain. plain. Engage your brain, brain before, before your, your mouth's in gear. Oh, oh, tell them what so on this week's episode of Trade Talk, I'll be dealing with Dean from Wright Reynolds. And how's it going, Dean? It's going pretty well. Yeah. Pretty so. Well. My uh, my brother had referred me to over to Dean because obviously you're doing good work. We've worked together in the past, yeah. Yeah, so I just thought I would interview you and ask how you get started. Like, you kind of filled me in a little bit on your history, but we want the viewers to kind of... Yeah, really, uh, I mean, I worked for some guys when I was younger yeah. and uh, I needed to pay for university. So yeah. I decided I'd uh, do decks and fences. Um, and then if university didn't work out, I'd do decks and fences and I'd only have to work when it was sunny. Yeah. But uh, that didn't really work out. I did one fence, um, <laughs> and then it just kind of graduated into renovations, which was, yeah. I'd already had a background in a little bit. So yeah. uh, from there, it just kind of kept going. And then I finished school. Um, I actually worked in an office in Toronto for about a year, just under a year. And I got a call from some friends here who said, hey, we're doing a restaurant and we're behind. Would you come back home and uh, finish it? So. I kind of gave my notice and yeah. came back, and I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, you weren't, so. you weren't for the corporate world. It wasn't your thing. It's it, I just not for me, you know. Yeah. It was uh, a little too slow-paced. So what did you take so. in school? I never asked you that. I took economics. Oh, okay. So, yeah, obviously not yeah. quite related, but uh, yeah. much more enjoyable. Yeah, but it still, that helps with, like, project management and everything. It helps with a lot of Yeah, I, I suppose if uh, there's there's lessons you can take from it that you yeah. can kind of apply to everyday, everyday life in any business. Yeah. Um, but it's... It's not as exciting as, not that construction's overly exciting, yeah. but you get to meet new people, you're always going to different places. Yeah. So much more enjoyable than uh, just watching the clock. So you started like with residential and now you've done a lot more commercial stuff. Yeah, so residential, obviously, I think that's where most guys start. Yeah. Uh, I've started, like I said, fencing and decking. Mm -hmm. um, started in a Dodge Neon. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's kind of all I could afford when I was in school. I'm not good with cars. I'm trying to picture what that looks like. Uh, it's just a four-door little. Oh, okay. Oh, little that. Car. Oh, I think that's the Dodges that my dad. My dad uses the the Dodge like the yeah. guns, right? Yeah, same oh, brand. Okay, same okay. brand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I started there, and then we got into you know business with some house flippers. You know, we were yeah. doing a lot of their work oh. uh, for them. And uh, it's a great place to kind of build a company, but it's not a great place to stay because yeah. uh, they're obviously in business to pay as little as possible. And yeah. sometimes there's conflict with the quality of work you want to do and the quality of work they want to they want to have done. Yeah. Um, so just two different business models. So from yeah. there, you just kind of graduate up and you get in more and more into residential. We get into a lot of, uh, we just build in residential uh, into a lot more like custom mill work and yeah. things like that, bigger projects, obviously additions and everything else. And then we yeah. kind of graduated into the commercial space, and now we live in the commercial space, uh, probably 90 percent. So do you have somebody do. that helps with the like, design program and stuff, or uh, do I have you, a, like AutoCAD? And so or? yeah, we use some programs ourselves in house, but uh, for the most part, we'll we'll sub most of it out to draftsmen and architects oh, because okay. ultimately they're. Uh, 
at this level, they'll apply for the permits. I used to take permits oh, in myself. Okay. I was going to say you would have started out doing all everything yeah, yourself. But I have my own business too. Yeah, and now goals. that's just not a possibility. <laughs> no. um, yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's easier that way. You know, you have certain people who do certain things. And yeah. also the labor market has changed a lot since I started. So yeah. when I first started, you know, I used to be able to find anybody. Like you'd, you'd have more people than you were looking for. Yeah. And then it got to a point where you just couldn't find you know, good people. What's Not that you can't find good people anywhere, but there are definitely, but in general, like for uh, in large amounts. Mm -hmm. And now with COVID, uh, and it's not just myself, it's everybody else in the business, um, yeah. is you just can't find people. Yeah. So it's, it's changed a lot. And I found that a lot of us have, have started to lean on each other more, uh, where we help each other out. We sub from each other more than uh, we rely on our own employees for everything. Yeah, because um, you know those guys are like reliable then. Yeah, yeah, and you just, you can't like, COVID, obviously a lot of guys decided that they just, they don't come back to work yeah. or um, for us, like we're a general contracting company at this point. Yeah. Um, so for us, employees are, uh, are necessary, but we all, like we get into a lot of electrical and a lot of plumbing and I'm not trying to grow an electrical company or grow a plumbing company. I'm not an electrician, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm not a plumber. Yeah. Um, so, so we already sub those. Sub and on. then when we're doing commercial, you have large amounts of drywall and usually timelines. So, you know, you, the guy who does drywall every day is gonna be better at it than, uh, a guy who does it once a week. Yeah, and so do you, you manage a lot of those projects, plus you do the work yourself, a lot of work yourself. Yeah, so I, I don't do as much work myself as I used to. Obviously, okay, it's yeah. impossible. Um, a lot of my day is spent either ordering stuff or visiting customers, uh, yeah. obviously checking on jobs, setting up jobs. We do do, I, I still do work every day. But overseeing everything to make sure it all comes together. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Uh, the project management is the biggest part of my, yeah. my job now. Um, but like, I don't think you'll ever get to a point where or, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'd be able to get to a point where I just couldn't physically get in there. And do, yeah, exactly, right? like, <laughs> There's never going to be a point where you don't have dirt on no, your shirt. It's just know who you are as a Patience person. is <laughs> not uh, to watch somebody struggle, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not built into me. So, uh, yeah, we'll always, we'll always help. We'll always do yeah. something. Well, that's probably why you've, like, excelled with what you do is because you, you, you help and you don't just like sit back, you like, you're yeah, and I mean, in the thick of it. If you were to talk to some of my guys, they might have a different opinion yeah. some days, but. Uh, but integrity does a yeah. lot, like you said, you're all, you've all been referrals, like. Yeah, so hmm. we don't advertise at all. Yeah, that's um, awesome. It's kind of a, it's actually an old carpet cleaner, uh, carpet cleaner, carpet installer, uh, friend of our families. I asked him when I first started, the Yellow Pages was calling me saying, oh, you've yeah. got to advertise, you've got to advertise. Yeah. And uh, I asked, just asked his opinion. He'd been in business for 30, 40 years, and he said, you know what? He goes, don't waste your money. He goes, because you're, 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 too, you're too young, uh, you're too new. He goes, if you spend your money on that, you'll constantly be chasing, spending more to, to get more calls. Mm -hmm. He said, just build your business slow and let word of mouth take you. He goes, word of mouth, you'll build slower, but you'll be busy forever. And mm -hmm. to be honest, I, uh, I'm not, we never look for work. It's the same thing with me now, like after the, the few, few years that I've done it, it took a while to build up, but everybody's like referrals. Yeah, that's no, and it's, I'm the same, but it's, it's integrity, like you having integrity and, and doing right by people and like saying what you're gonna, actually doing what you said you're yeah. gonna do. Well, it's and like, it's nice because on one hand, uh, people wanna trust and like the person who's doing the work for them. And yeah. they, that's why word of mouth is so good. Mm -hmm. But there's an entire different side to that coin, which is where I wanna like the people that I'm doing work for. Like we I, I want, yeah, we, you know, I want to enjoy working for the people that I'm working yeah. for. So I think it has to be a symbiotic kind of uh, relationship. And yeah. if it's not, I, I have no interest in, uh, in the work. Like I said, we're not starving for work uh, yeah. by any stretch. Um, in fact, we turn down an awful lot of work. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's not just about the bottom dollar and about money, 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 money. It's also about like, I do this every day. Am I going to do this every day for 40 years and not like the people that I'm yeah, working with? Yeah, it's about it peace and harmony sense. in your own life too and balance. Yeah. That for me, that's like the most important thing. Like some things aren't worth it. And so having yeah. balance and good people to work with and hearty people that you can relate to and like you can actually communicate with and get things achieved, whether yeah. it be like workers or the people that you do jobs for. It's like Yeah, and you, I think every company yeah. kind of learns as they go and I think your stress levels graduate with you you know and yeah. just the way you do things and approach things and as you get older you've been in it longer yeah you, you start to realize that like yeah I, I do have an option here you know you don't have no. to take everything <laughs> exactly how you know? I used to feel too. so and, and yeah then you and you it also gives you more time to concentrate on the work you're doing um, yeah. instead of trying to be like everything to everybody or yeah. you know uh, make it just proper scheduling uh, obviously is important and in commercial 
it's uh, it's time is money. Like this is their livelihood. Yeah. Uh, like your customer, this is how they make money. It's how they feed their family. So meeting deadlines is extremely important. So. Yeah. Um, and having all those sub trades and everybody working together because you can't just take it all on yourself. So. Yeah, and I some people take a, especially in the residential market, you know, they'll they'll take I don't want to say offense, but they'll take it kind of like, oh, well, you're subbing that out, you're not doing everything yourself. And I guess my response, and probably from a little bit of an economics background, is, well, realistically, how could I do as good a job as a guy who only does this? Yeah. How it's impossible. So right. if you want the best quality job, yeah. you probably just need somebody who knows somebody who's very good at what they do and does it every day and can put all those pieces together. Exactly. And you'll get the best quality job. And you'll you'll probably get the cleanest job and probably the most efficient and cost effective job. Yeah, so, that is true. Uh, but a lot of people they kinda like you know, in the residential market especially, they're kinda like, Oh, you're not doing every not everybody. Yeah. But uh, you know, you're not doing it all yourself and it's like, Well, I can't. Like yeah. they didn't have twenty years to learn each one individually. Life's just not that long. Well yeah, and you do such a good job because you have your specific expertise and they have their specific expertise. Yeah. And then you culminate together. But it's a big task and a chore getting all those people throughout the years, like and getting reliable people, guys. Yeah, it does work. take like, a long time to build those is, teams. Yeah. And then it's also yeah. schedules, right? Yeah. So like I mean everybody's busy and then just yeah. keeping schedules in order because things it's construction right so yeah. if everything is going right in construction you've got big problems so like I always say <laughs> if something's not going wrong you've got bigger problems than you realize but I, I was gonna say so right now we're at legends and like they're just doing doing some concrete work here is yeah they're just doing putting uh, just doing a little bit of work on the patio yeah so they just uh, removed a concrete bar that they used to have here because oh, they don't really use the bar anymore oh, the bar oh, and uh, okay. just a little bit more shaded area for some tables oh, okay yeah. uh, you know so people can enjoy the patio if it's a little too hot out or uh, if it's raining a little bit they so still have somewhere how do they to put the stone back in like are, or are they just gonna leave so, it looking like yeah that? this is an exposed aggregate okay. um, so but this this was laid like 10 years ago so to try and match that That's what would I was almost say, be you, you'd notice anyway so it's more it's more about a, a safety making yeah. sure it's safe just like There's stucco no like, when you have to <laughs> you patch stucco it's like well a, yeah you're better off doing the whole pan yeah, right like, sure, so yeah. so is there anything else that like what is your goals going forward just to kind of end the interview um like wh where do you see the next five years I think, ten years? well at the moment uh the way my business is is going is i uh, i do a lot more like i said of the project management side of things yeah and considering the labor market is where it is and we have a ton of baby boomers retiring um we're gonna have a huge shortage in the trade so what i've started to do is i have my subs i've been using for 20 years and 10 years and everything else but uh we've taken on some young sub companies mm -hmm. and instead of hiring employees and building up our company uh what we're doing is we're actually putting time into training them so we'll let them take on jobs that are uh, not out of their wheelhouse but they don't yeah. fully know it, but we'll actually go and spend the time to show them and train them and supervise them and then help them develop that skill so that they can Oh, wow. uh, kind of go on and do that for their customers on their own. So, so when you choose those people, it's people that you you feel like they're easy to work with or good yeah, guys. Yeah, they, they ambitious. You know, yeah. they want to learn. Um, not not afraid to fail. Uh, yeah. Don't want to fail, but not afraid to fail. Not too much of an ego because you know. And <laughs> yeah, and, and and hungry to learn. So, okay. um, and you know, we're not. It's not like we're like, hey, charging them for it. We're yeah. just. Uh, we, we think that more subs are needed because yeah. it's not just me, it's it's everybody, like I said, who's in yeah. the same position as me. Yeah. There's a huge lack of... Uh, ah, so you're looking down the pipeline and trades. this also comes with your like economics. Yeah, and I mean, too, it's also... Right? Like it's, looking at the way things... You know, it's, it, it is altruistic, but it's also not. I mean, in the sense that like we're training guys who can do some of our work as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a profit motive yeah. uh, as well, but it also, it, it helps them. Like it's an awful lot of effort uh, on our part in the beginning and it's it may not pay off it may pay off but yeah. so far it's been it's been received very well um, they've come leaps and bounds uh, I know the one the one company I'm working with uh, their gross profits for the entire year um, we they're doing about they're doing that in about two months now oh wow. uh, through us so oh, wow. if they go back the two years they're around their gross profits are not gross profits, they're gross revenues for the entire year. They're doing that in about every two months now. Oh, wow. So it's uh, it's been a big difference and a big growth for them. And, and they've been able to business. add employees as well? Or yeah, just they've been able to hire and add employees. Because of the scale, and, right? Yep. Okay. So, and for oh. us, that's for all. For my business, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's worked out really well. I Like, I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, I, I like teaching. Yeah. So it's, it's worked out uh, really well from a standpoint of I get to do something. Because after this long, I mean, there's nothing new. Like, there's yeah. not, like, we've... We've done high rises, we've done property management, we've done house flips, investor work, we've done commercial, we've done residential, 
I've done oil field. This is this I is mean, so good, but you're where just am I? Right now. Where am I going? Uh, where I'm going to find something new and exciting? Uh, mentorship we know it in and out. Rewarding to, it does. It well. does, and that's that's where we're at now. Where we're, if we can teach other guys, and then you kind of get that feeling back of 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 uh, excitement, yeah. where it's not just like I'm doing the same thing because that I've done for 20 years. Yeah. I'm watching and helping and showing somebody else how to do yeah. it. And like I've always said, like success is a team sport. So yeah. um, it's 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 good to bring on new members, yeah. you know. And it's it's not a competition. Like I don't. If you think that in the trades business in 2023 in Ontario that there's competition, uh, then I don't know what 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 economy you're looking at because <laughs> there's more than enough work to go around. Um, there's, there's, there's plenty of it. I everybody. always say that with every business, there's more than enough, you know what I mean? There is, and be good at it and treat people well, and you, you'll never run out of work. So I just want to say thank you. Like, I don't know. We, it's funny, we, we just figured out that we went to high school Yeah, together. we didn't know that, actually. <laughs> yeah, and so, like, you were friends with my brother, and, like, yeah. and we also are really alternative-minded with health, so we kind of, it was an easy yeah, conversation. Quick, so yeah. I just want to say thank you.